My name is Sarah Morehouse, and I'm one of the librarians at Empire State College Online Library. This video explains why information sources are categorized as primary, secondary, and tertiary sources, how to tell those kinds of sources apart, what each kind of source is used for in scholarly research, and where to find each kind of source. In order for primary, secondary, and tertiary sources to make sense, you need to put it in the context of scholarly communication. In other words, the ongoing conversation about a topic among experts that takes place in the form of research articles, books, and conference presentations. As a student, it is a fact of life that when you complete an assignment like a research paper or presentation, the obvious audience is your instructor and possibly also your fellow students. And the obvious purpose is to learn and to demonstrate what you've learned. That's learning both in terms of the subject matter of the course and in terms of becoming a better critical thinker and better writer and presenter. But your assignments also have a second audience and purpose. If your instructor tells you to create an advertisement for a hypothetical product, your second audience is the audience of your ad, and your second purpose is to convince those people that their life will be better if they buy your product. The same thing with a research paper or presentation assignment. Your second audience is the scholarly community for your topic. Having that audience allows you to make certain assumptions about the kind of language you'll use and what things you can safely talk about without having to explain. And your second purpose is to participate in the scholarly conversation about your topic. You're picking up the thread of conversation that you found by reading scholarly articles and books, and you're adding to it with your own findings, ideas, and interpretations. Perhaps you have a new fact to add, or maybe you found a mistake in someone else's work. But whatever it is, the whole point of it is that you're not just absorbing the information out there and writing it down in your own words. You're adding something new to the existing body of knowledge and the collective understanding. Keep that in mind throughout this video. It will become clear why your instructors insist so strongly that you use primary sources. Many of us went through school being taught that knowledge is a huge set of facts and skills that we acquire. In a very basic way, that's true for memorizing multiplication tables and spelling and history names and dates. But it's very flawed. This model of education falls apart as soon as you get to subjects that require creativity and critical thinking, which is almost everything that's useful in the real world. When you learn, you're creating knowledge in your own mind. It isn't coming in from outside. You're picking up the data and the patterns, putting them together with the concepts you already have, and constructing new pathways in your mind. This doesn't happen in a vacuum, although the pathways in your mind are yours alone, and your interpretation is as unique as your fingerprint, you're immersed in a social world. There's a scholarly language and subculture, and an even narrower, more specific language and subculture for your subject area. Part of college education is being immersed in the language and subculture for your subject area and getting used to participating in it. The way you participate in scholarly culture and scholarly communication is by reading articles and books and watching and listening to presentations on the one hand, and by responding to them with your own ideas on the other. At this point, you're probably wondering when I'm going to get to the part about primary sources. Bear with me. Say Smith writes an article on the flocking behavior of pigeons and says that pigeon flocks follow a leader. Jones disagrees and promptly does some new research and comes up with what Jones says is proof that Smith's theory is wrong, and in fact pigeons flock by consensus. Gomez thinks Smith and Jones each have some good points and writes up a research study demonstrating that while pigeons do flock more or less by consensus, some individual pigeons have more influence on the outcome of the consensus than others, and this conversation goes on and on indefinitely. As a student, your job is to jump right into that ongoing debate. Learn what people know or think they know about a subject. Learn what the controversies are, and learn enough that you have something to say on one side or another. It may be a long time before you are knowledgeable and experienced enough for one of your articles to get through peer review, and publishing scholarly articles probably isn't what you want out of life anyway. But understanding that that is your goal as a college student, at least in theory, can help you understand some of the more arbitrary rules about how you do college research and writing. All right, now I can talk about primary, secondary, and tertiary sources and have it make sense. 
I said that scholarly communication is an ongoing, multi-threaded debate about a topic. There are rules for the discussion, and they basically amount to requiring all your arguments to be based on evidence and reason. Primary sources are your evidence. Secondary sources interpret the evidence and provide the reasons that back up the interpretation. Tertiary sources are just teaching and learning tools that summarize a topic. As a student and a scholar, you're a reader or listener, and a writer or presenter of all three, primary, secondary, and tertiary sources. First, let's talk about you as a consumer of information. When you want to research a company's performance, you go to the annual reports and SEC filings. When you want to research the behavior of sunspots, you go to NASA's photographs and data sets. Those are the primary sources. But you can't write a paper based solely on data sets. You can't know if you have something new and useful to contribute to the conversation until you've read what other people are saying. You can't be sure of your interpretations until you've as assessed the strengths and weaknesses of other interpretations. That's when you go to secondary sources, other scholars' books, articles, and conference presentations about your topic. Maybe I'm putting the cart before the horse. You're a beginner in this subject area, and scholarly articles are full of technical language and complicated concepts. You need some entry-level reading, and that's where tertiary sources come in. You can start with the textbook for your course, and you can also get encyclopedias and handbooks and other kinds of reference books from the library and online. You can consult them for facts and figures, and you can rely on them to provide a good summary or overview of what you're interested in. As I've been saying all along, you're not just a consumer of knowledge, you're also creating it. Whenever you do an experiment and gather data, or observe a phenomenon and take notes, whenever you interview someone for an oral history or record an event, you're creating a primary source. When you write a research paper based on the evidence from primary sources plus your own original ideas, then you're creating a secondary source. And whenever you do another kind of assignment where you summarize, reflect on, or critique some articles or books, you're creating a tertiary source. By now, you've probably arrived at what librarians usually tell students at the beginning. Primary sources are the closest to the source. They're first-hand accounts, direct and indirect evidence, recordings, and things like that. Secondary sources are one step away from that, and tertiary sources are one more step removed. Is there such a thing as another step removed? That would be called a quaternary source. Of course they exist. Any middle school student who writes an essay based on an encyclopedia article is creating a quaternary source. But apart from the reading and writing practice, the value of such a source is questionable. The next thing I want to do is provide some concrete examples of different kinds of primary sources. One obvious kind of primary source is an interview or oral history taken from a person who witnessed or was involved in an event or phenomenon. Historians use oral histories to learn about relatively recent history. Anthropologists, psychologists, and sociologists depend on interviews for data. Marketing researchers also use interviews and focus groups. Another kind of primary source is the notes, data sets, and recordings taken from experiments and observations. These are practically the only kinds of primary sources used in math and the hard sciences. They also predominate in the harder social sciences, like economics and many fields of psychology. They are used along with other kinds of primary sources in all the other social sciences and even in some methods of studying history. Intellectual and cultural history, art history, culture studies, and to some extent anthropology and sociology depend on specimens of art from a certain time, place, and segment of society in order to study that society. The specimen can be literature, visual art, architecture, music, theater, dance, and even fashion. Here's a dilemma. It's obvious that the video of British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher's speech is a primary source. But video recordings are a relatively recent invention. Nineteenth century Prime Minister William Gladstone's speeches were recorded in writing, which is a medium that leaves a lot of room for the person doing the recording to put their own slant on things. And yet written transcripts of speeches are still primary sources. They are evidence, but some evidence is more reliable than others. The same kind of thing applies to the Japanese picture of Admiral Perry's ships arriving in Japan. 
There were no cameras at the time, and this is what we have for historical documentation. It's obviously an artist's interpretation. It doesn't even attempt to be photorealistic. What can be gathered from it as historical fact, and what can be learned from it about how the artist and his contemporaries viewed the event? Another kind of primary source is personal communications like diaries, letters, and notebooks. These are first-hand accounts by eyewitnesses or participants in an event or phenomenon. But as a researcher, you need to take into account that they were written for one audience and purpose and context, and you are using them for something very different. When you read personal documents as primary sources, take into account things like culture and the background of the person writing them. Also consider that they assumed that they were in private, so they might not accurately represent the dominant ways of thinking of their time and place. For example, two lovers might write about running away together which doesn't necessarily mean that it was something they'd be able to do or willing to do in real life. Learn as much as you can about what their everyday life would have been like and use that to contextualize their words. One final kind of primary source that I'll mention is reports. These days reports are often available online on the websites of government agencies, nonprofit organizations, and corporations. They'll report on their own gains and losses, successes and failures, personnel and policies. They'll also report on topics of interest to themselves and their field of activity. For example, the United Nations issues reports on everything from the world's water supply, to the status of women, to international conflicts. NASA has reports on climate, as well as astronomy. Think tanks produce reports on the economy and social issues. Just as you have to be careful interpreting primary sources written by individuals, these reports may be a rich source of data, but they can also be spin-doctored. A company's annual report might have to report losses, but even ethical companies gloss over negative things and put them in a better light. A report on unemployment from a conservative think tank and one from a liberal think tank may have used different research methods and come up with completely different numbers. What I'm trying to say is that while primary sources are used for evidence in research, that doesn't necessarily mean they're objective. Even raw numbers aren't necessarily objective because you have to look at how those numbers were obtained. I hope I'm not discouraging you by talking about all these complications. Just by having these questions in your mind, you're a step ahead. So now that I've talked about primary sources, secondary and tertiary sources are going to be easy. Scholarly journal articles and scholarly books are usually secondary sources. They use the primary sources as evidence. They also refer to other secondary sources for context and to back up their points. Some popular magazine articles and nonfiction books are also secondary sources for the same reasons. Others are less clear. Most news and news magazine articles about new research are actually just summaries of the research studies, so that makes them more like a tertiary source. Depending on what your instructor wants, you might be able to cite them as a secondary source. On the other hand, it might be a better idea to find the scholarly article that it's based on and read that. Quality documentaries are usually secondary sources, too. Tertiary sources are just as straightforward. Your textbooks are tertiary sources. Textbooks are produced specifically to guide a student who's taking a course through the content that the course covers. They're not based on original research. Instead, they summarize and synthesize content from secondary sources in a way that's designed to help the student digest it. Because they're based on secondary sources, they are tertiary sources. Reference books like encyclopedias, handbooks, manuals, guides, and so forth are the same. They're written to serve as a compendium of facts and figures, or an overview of a topic. They're not original research, but are based on the original research of multiple scholars, so that's what makes them tertiary. However, there's one exception. In any reference database or reference section of a physical library, you'll find some books that are compilations of selected primary sources, like the American Decades series or one of those huge art books where you can look at individual paintings. Those are used as primary sources, even though they're in the same section with the tertiary sources. One thing I get a lot of questions about is why can't you cite tertiary sources like reference books or your textbook? Well, sometimes you can. Some instructors, for some kinds of assignments, want you to cite any source of information that you use, no matter what it is. 
If you didn't know that panthers are the same thing as black jaguars and you had to look it up, they want to know where you looked it up. It's part of how they're evaluating your progress. But in general, for a research paper, you're expected to follow the same rule that any scholar would follow in writing an article, and that means that you use only primary sources and scholarly secondary sources. If you find a piece of good information in a tertiary source and you want to use that information, find out what the tertiary source was based on and cite that. Why is that important? For one thing, if you cited the tertiary source, you would be ignoring the fact that some scholar did all the legwork to find and publish the information. Your readers would be deprived of the opportunity to go back to that scholar's work and learn something for themselves. For another, by citing a tertiary source, you're making your paper a quaternary source. That is too far away from what you're reporting on to be of any value to your readers. The information has been through too many layers of summarizing and interpreting. Get as close to your topic as you can. Another common question is where to find primary sources. Fortunately, they're all over the place. If you're able to travel, you can find them in the special collections rooms of libraries, in historical societies, and in archives. You may also find primary sources through your own legwork by interviewing people involved in something, conducting experiments or observations, or discovering collections of documents, artifacts, and ephemera. Finally, the Internet is a great place to get primary sources. All those libraries, archives, museums, and historical societies that I mentioned are digitizing their collections as fast as they can. All the public domain content and all the content that they hold the rights to is right out there on the web for anyone to access. All you have to do is enter your topic into a search engine along with the phrase primary sources and chances are you'll find something. Because we get a lot of reference questions from people who just need a primary source on their topic, I created this primary sources guide. It's at http colon slash slash subjectguides.esc.edu slash primary sources. You might want to write that down and bookmark it on your computer. One of the tabs is Library Databases, which has various searchable library resources that contain either all primary sources or primary sources mixed in with other content. And the other tabs are for web resources, and they're sorted by broad subject area, like history, literature, politics, and so forth. So that's it for primary, secondary, and tertiary sources. The most important thing to remember is that the reason you want primary sources is that they're the closest to the original source of information, and the reason you don't cite tertiary sources in your research papers is that they're too far from the original source of information. As always, if you have any questions about this topic, or any research or library-related topic, please contact us at http colon slash slash www.esc.edu slash ask a